So we are in the middle of uh, probabilistic reasoning uh, with uh, Bayesian networks. Oh, not yet in the middle, we just started with it. And I introduced this example. Oh, do we have a Zeigestock here? Oh, but we have a laser pointer. But we should have one. Ah, yeah, könnte ich den mal haben da auf dem Fensterbank? Okay, so I introduced this example, um, which is quite a nice uh, example for um, Bayesian networks because it's a small example, it's, it's easy to understand, and it shows all the interesting features of Bayesian networks. Huh? Um, the question is, or I mean, what the inventor, Judea Pearl, wanted, he wanted to have a kind of a, a expert system that tells him whether there was a burglary in his house at home or not, while he sits in his office far away from home. Huh? Ah, jetzt bin der schon wieder. Um, and he has these two persons, John and Mary, who can call him in the office and tell him there was a burglary. Huh? But they, they don't see what happens inside his house. They just can hear his alarm, the alarm of his house, sound. Yeah? Um, so when John hears the alarm, he may call. Yeah? Um, and when Mary hears the alarm, she may call uh, too. And as you can see, their calling only depends on alarm. Uh, it does not directly depend on burglary and on earthquake. But this variable alarm depends on burglary and on earthquake. Oh, yeah. So that's why we call this, uh, this variable alarm a hidden variable. Uh, okay. And uh, here in this um, Bayesian network, in this graph, you can already see all the information that is necessary in order to develop such a Bayesian network. Um, first, there are um, edges between the nodes and they are directed. Huh? They are directed uh, from... Um, from the causes to the towards the the final diagnostic variables. Yeah? So the these uh, arrows they represent causality. Yeah? So there is a causal connection between earthquake and alarm. That means earthquake is a cause for alarm. Burglary is a cause for alarm, and alarm is a cause for John calling and for Mary calling. Yeah? Okay. And you see there are no, um, no arrows entering these two nodes, and that's why here we only need the prior probabilities. The probability for burglary, which is 0.1%, and the probability for earthquake, which is 0.2%. Yeah? And here, what do we have here? This is what we call a CPT, Conditional Probability Table. Um, and here we, have, uh, here we have the probability for alarm given burglary and earthquake. So this is, uh, I mean, what we have here is um, P of uh, alarm given burglary and earthquake. This conditional probability is represented by that table. Huh? So probability for alarm given burglary and earthquake, 
probability for alarm given burglary and not earthquake. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the difference between these two is quite interesting. So if we have a burglary and no earthquake, then the alarm uh, sounds with 94%. But if there is no burglary but an earthquake, then the probability for alarm is much smaller. Huh? And that's quite important. I mean, we would actually ha like to have zero here. Huh? But, I mean, it's not a perfect system. Um, and the probability for alarm, given no burglary and no earthquake, is 0.1%, which is uh, very small. Uh, so this is kind of the, the probability for really useless uh, false alarms. Okay, and uh, so what we have here, here we have such a CPT again probability for Mary calling given alarm and given no alarm. And of course it's very important that there is a big difference between these two numbers and here too. Huh? And uh, what you can already see is that for John the probability for a false alarm is much higher than uh, for Mary. So it's actually five times as high as uh, for Mary. Okay, any questions about this example here? We will, of course, now continue uh, computing some things. Um, yes, so we are now interested in, for example, the probability for John calling given a burglary. That's an interesting uh, number we would like to know. Or maybe it's even more interesting to know the probability for burglary given that John calls. That's actually what we know, want to know. If John calls Pearl, he wants to know, okay, so now John called, what does that mean for me? How high is the probability for a burglary given John calls? Or we would of course also want to know the same thing for Mary. And maybe we would want to know what is the probability for a burglary if John or Mary calls and also if John and Mary call. Yeah. Now let's start going into the computations. First, we define the term of conditional independence. Two variables A and B are called conditionally independent given C if this equation holds. And this is very intuitive. Now for a moment, just forget this C here. So if you, if you delete all the C's in this equation, what does that mean then? You should have done your exercises. You didn't, obviously. Then this is just the independence of the two variables A and B. P of A and B is equal to P of A times P of B. Okay? You remember independence of two variables? Um, and now we are talking about independence um, of A and B in the world C. So if we just look at events where, it's, where C is true. Huh? And, de and that's why we call this conditional independence. So A and B are independent given C. And then this equation must hold. And examples, uh, probability uh, for John and Mary given alarm is equal to this product. And that means John and Mary are conditionally independent given alarm. Uh, um, and also John and burglary uh, given alarm. Uh, so, I mean, this is not, this is not um, trivial. So th this does not hold for all variables. 
Now let's look, let's go back to our graph. So we had John and Mary and John and burglary. So John and Mary. So it looks like John and Mary are conditionally independent given alarm. And also John and burglary are conditionally independent given alarm. Yes. So let's look at these two first. What does that mean? I mean the semantics behind this is so now imagine there is this house and the alarm sounds. And here lives John and in the neighbor house somewhere lives Mary. And now these two are independent. So the, the probability that Mary calls does not depend on whether John calls or not. Yeah? I mean, it would not be independent if, suppose Mary sees the alarm and then she say, thinks, oh, should I call Pearl? And then she first calls John and ask, hey John, should I call him or should you call him? And then they would no longer be independent. But if they don't know about uh, uh, each other's calling behavior, they're independent. Okay, so, so much about these two. Now about John and burglary. Um, now again, assume the alarm sounds. Huh? The alarm sounds and uh, as soon as the alarm sounds, then John reacts on the alarm. And uh, I mean, our basic assumption was that John does not know about burglary. John only can hear or see the alarm, but John has no idea what happens behind the house. Maybe there was a burglar uh, crashing a window, maybe not. So these two are conditionally independent given alarm. Huh? So, given alarm means I know the status of the variable alarm. So, alarm may be true or it may be false and that's the same thing. So, given, suppose there is no alarm. We know there is no alarm. But, and, and then again, these two variables are independent. John doesn't know about whether there was a burglary or not. Okay, and we will see that, I mean, uh, this can be proven, we don't do these proofs here. Uh, it can be proven that in such a Bayesian network, uh, when we have uh, such um, <coughs> uh, directed edges, and uh, these two are successor nodes from alarm. And in such a constellation, if there is no edge between John and Mary, then they are conditionally independent given their predecessor, their common predecessor node. And also here, if there is no uh, directed uh, edge between burglary and John, then these two guys are conditionally independent given alarm. That's very important and this is actually the semantics of a Bayesian network. So when we construct this Bayesian network, we have to ask ourselves, is John conditionally independent from, uh, from burglary given alarm? If this is the case, then we draw no uh, directed edge here. Otherwise, we would need this directed edge. And now if we would have such an edge between burglar, burglary and John, then this conditional probability table would look different. How would it look like then? If the 
burglary is just directed to John, then every time there's a burglary, John will respond. Excuse me again? That John will respond directly to the burglary. Um, yes, but my question was how would this CPT change? No what? N no false? Every time there's a burglary, then John would respond. Oh, no. I mean, you're saying the probability for John uh, calling given a burglary is 1. Yes. We don't know that. It may be 0.75. But John may call being a burglary without the alarm sounding. Without the alarm sounding. If they are connected. Yes, that, uh, I mean, that may be true, yes. Yes, that may be true. But again, my question is, how would this uh, table look like then? Yes, there would be a second column on the left side with burglary and it would actually be similar to this one. Yeah? Because this variable John would depend on alarm and on burglary. Yeah? And so you see, as soon as we put this, uh, this extra edge here, then we would need more numbers here. Here we have four numbers and then here we would need four numbers too. Yeah? Um, so the, the, our Bayesian network would become more complicated if we, uh, with, with every uh, new edge, it would be more difficult, we would need more numbers here. Yeah? And of course our goal is, is always to describe our systems as simple as possible. Yeah? So whenever there are conditional independencies, that's the important thing, Whenever two variables are conditionally independent given a third variable, we omit uh, the corresponding edge uh, connecting them. I mean the default is, the default would actually be to draw edges between any pair of nodes and then we would have a fully connected graph. Huh? Um, but uh, uh, we humans don't like fully connected graphs because we can't understand them. Huh? I mean, then a fully connected graph would correspond to writing all the entries into our joint probability distribution. Now let's talk about the joint probability distribution. We have five binary variables, okay? How many entries does our joint probability distribution have here? Five binary variables. Yeah, which is 32. And then we can uh, remove one of them because of the normalization condition, so 31. Yeah? So 31 uh, values is what we need if we know nothing about the application. Yeah? And now how many do we have here? We just have to count 1, 2, <coughs> plus 4, give 6, plus 4 is 10. You see, we only need 10 uh, numbers instead of 31. Huh? So, uh, and that is because we do have um, a number of independence assumptions. Huh? Um, the same thing with Mary and earthquake, and now let's look at burglary and earthquake. And here it's different because these variables they have no predecessors. They are kind of the root nodes in our, or two root nodes in our directed graph. And because they have no predecessors, we cannot talk about conditional independence. We can just ask whether these variables are independent or not. I mean, 
look, here we have a prior and here we have a prior. We, of course, we can ask, is the probability for burglary and earthquake equal to the product of these two guys or not? Huh? So if P of burglary and earthquake is equal to the product of these two, then they are independent. Huh? Otherwise, we would need to draw an edge between these two. Okay, but we assume they are independent. But I think this, is, this assumption um, is quite a good assumption. I mean, typically an earthquake doesn't uh, look whether there are burglars around when it happens. Huh? I mean, this is for sure, I guess. Huh? Maybe the other way around is not so sure, because quite often, when I, at least when there is a, a, a really bad earthquake and it destroys a whole cities, then people flee from the city, and then maybe burglars enter the city and uh, steal everything. Huh? So, but we assume they are independent for this example. Okay, so yeah, we already understand a little bit of this um, Bayesian network. And now let's do some computations. Um, yes, we defined conditional independence. Um, yeah, and uh, now there are two uh, simple conclusions from our conditional independence. I mean, this equation here is the definition of conditional independence of A and B. And there is the conclusion, if A and B are conditionally independent given C, then we also have this equation. Now, just uh, delete the C from here and here. And what do you see? You see the equation you already know for uh, variables A and B being independent. Huh? And now we have this extra condition C. So now A and B are conditionally independent given C. OK, and the same thing with uh, A and B swapped. This is the analogous equation. OK, but now, I mean, this was the definition of conditional independence, and this is a conclusion from the definition, and therefore we have to, pro to prove this conclusion. And that's, I, I mean, we do this now. Let's uh, look at the joint distribution P of A, B, and C. Yeah? Um, and we can write this using uh, the, the product rule um, as P of A, B given C times P of C. I mean, if you bring the P of C down here, then you see this is just the definition of this uh, conditional uh, probability. Huh? So this is elementary, just using the definition. Um, and here, oh, what do, you, what do we do here? Oh, yes, of course. I mean, <laughs> we use the conditional independence. We use this equation here. Uh, if A and B are conditionally independent given C, then we can write this term as this product here. Okay. Um, now let's look at the joint distribution again and use the product, uh, no, the, the chain rule. We use the chain rule. You remember the chain rule? Maybe we have to go back to the chain rule. Where did we have it? Was it here? No. Oh, that was in the beginning. No, I don't go back so far. Sorry. <coughs> I mean, the, the chain rule is just a repeated application of the product rule. So we use the product rule um, for this variable A. So this is P of A given B and C times P of B comma C. Yeah? And then we apply the product rule again to, B, to the probability for B and C, and then we get P of B given C times uh, P of C. Yeah? So we, this is a, we, tw we apply the product rule twice to this uh, joint distribution, and that's what we get. Okay, and now 
we can compare. Now we have two formulas for our joint distribution. Uh, and now we compare these two right-hand sides. And look, this is the same as this, and this is the same as this. So these two guys have to be uh, equal. And that's what we get here. And this equation is actually this one. Okay, and now if we swap um, A and B, we can do the same proof again, and we will get this result. Any questions? Okay. So now let's continue with uh, computation of some uh, conditional probabilities. Yeah? I mean, we already said we want to know P of John given burglary. So probability for John calling given a burglary. Okay, I mean, we, it's, uh, we, that's an elementary start. We just write down the definition for this conditional probability. Yeah? And now, here we have the variables John and burglary. And of course, we have to introduce our hidden variable because we don't know we don't know this guy here so we have to introduce this intermediate variable alarm um, and now we get this here huh? um, I mean how can we introduce this variable uh, no let, let's let's look at this here how do we get from this to that I mean this is this is what we call marginalization this is the sum over all values of the variable alarm. Huh? So this, uh, this sums out, and yeah, that's what we call marginalization. Or, um, I mean, in this direction, a similar variant uh, of this equation is called conditioning. That's, we introduce a new variable. Okay. So, yeah, now we have to compute these two guys here. Uh, let's start with uh, John, burglary, and alarm. And again, we use the, um, the chain rule. So this is P of John given burglary and alarm times P of alarm given burglary times burglary. Uh, um, so we do, we do apply the product rule until we end at a, a prior probability. Uh, and uh, I mean, we are actually free to apply it in any direction. But the direction we apply our train rule is we want to have as the first variable our diagnosis variable and as the last one our original cause variable, which is burglary. Okay, yeah, and here we see John, P of John given burglary and alarm. Um, if John and burglary are conditionally independent given alarm, um, we can just omit this burglary here. This is the conditional independence of these uh, variables, John and burglary given alarm. And that's why we can just delete the burglary here. So that's what we get here. Huh? Yes. So now let's go back to our graph. John burglary. You see, we do have such a directed chain of variables. Burglary, alarm, John. And whenever we have such a directed chain, I mean, the relation between John and alarm is, ch alarm is the predecessor of John, burglary is the predecessor of alarm. Whenever we have such a directed chain, then, I mean, that's what we actually have proven now. Then we can write the, the joint distribution of these three variables in a very simple way. It's 
probability of John given alarm, or oh, maybe we should draw our uh, our graph here again. So we have burglary, earthquake, alarm, John, Mary. Okay. Um, yes, and we do have this directed graph, and now we can write the joint distribution for these three variables as probability of John given alarm <coughs> times probability of alarm given burglary times probability of burglary given any predecessor but there is no predecessor, so here we just use the prior. That's what we, that's exactly what we have here. John given alarm, alarm given burglary times P of burglary. Yeah? And you see this formula is simpler, easier than this one. Because of the conditional independence of John and burglary. If we would have this arrow here in between, then we could not do this simplification. Okay. Yes, I mean, yeah, let's, uh, let's start here again. Now, I, I draw this arrow here. If we would have this guy, then we, we would have to start with probability of John given all its predecessors. That's important. And now, if burglary is a predecessor, then we exactly need what we had here, and we could not simplify it. Huh? Okay. Haben wir da nicht irgendwo einen Wischlappen? Okay, now, um, yes, okay, now we have a formula for computing this guy here, huh? and we can replace this here, and that's what we get then, and we can do the same thing for, for this um, probability just replacing alarm uh, with not alarm. Okay, and now if we look at this formula, you see we can, uh, this P of burglary cancels out <coughs> here and here. So that's what remains. Huh? And now look at this. We already learned uh, how we can simplify our calculations. So, um, Probability for John given burglary is probability John given alarm times P of alarm given burglary. So we just squeeze this alarm in between here. But of course we also have to squeeze the not alarm in between. What's the reason? The reason is uh, the same as here. We just uh, introduced alarm and not alarm, um, yeah. Okay, so when you, when you look at this John given burglary and you have this variable alarm in between and conditional independence, then it's quite simple. You can just write it in this way. And this holds, uh, this is true in general. Okay, so now in order to compute this, we need probability uh, for John given alarm. That's what we know. We, we just can read it uh, from the, our CPT. Um, and then probability for alarm given burglary. We don't have this. Why? Look. We only have probability for alarm given these two variables. Okay, so that's, that's missing. So we have to compute 
um, P of alarm given burglary and also the, the, the symmetric um, uh, number P of not alarm given burglary. Okay, that's what we do next. Oh, no, so, sorry, what do we need? Alarm given burglary, yes, and that's what we compute now. Okay, we write down this conditional probability and then introduce uh, the variable earthquake. Why do we introduce earthquake? Yeah, because we know the corresponding conditional probabilities. Okay, we introduce earthquake and now um, we use the product rule um, here twice and we get this formula. Um, yeah, no, let's see. This is P of alarm given burglary and earthquake times and actually norma normally we would have here P of, maybe I just introduce it, yes. Um, so we would, uh, we would have here P of burglary, comma, earthquake. That's what we would have here. Huh? Why? Why is this what we, what we would get? We would, would get this term times this. Why? Because of the product rule. This is just a simple application of the product rule. This, uh, this joint uh, um, probability, alarm, burglary, and earthquake, um, and look at this conditional probability. The definition of this conditional probability is this, divided by, by this. Huh? Okay? But why is this, this red uh, term equal to this product? Hey boys, you have to do exercises with uh, conditional probabilities, otherwise you're having a hard time here now. I mean, this is, this is just uh, because burglary and earthquake are independent. When two variables are independent, then the conjunction is just the product of the, uh, the priors. Okay, so because of the independence we get this, and because of the independence, we get this here. Okay, um, and now, yeah, and now P of burglary cancels out again. And that's what we have. And now we can just enter the values from our CPTs. P of alarm given burglary and earthquake, 0.95 times P of earthquake, 0.002 and analogously these values, and finally we get 0.94. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's nice to know. So the probability for an alarm given a burglary is 94%. Okay, um, yes, and that's actually what we needed um, over here. P of alarm given burglary, that's what we need here, and P of not alarm given burglary, these two guys are missing. How about P of not alarm given burglary? What can you say about this? We don't uh, have an extra uh, computation for P of uh, what was it? Not alarm given burglary. Yeah, this guy here. We don't need to compute it. We can easily see it. It's one minus yeah, it's 1 minus 0.94, so it's 0 0.06. That's what we enter here. Huh? Um, yes. And the result for P of John calling given burglary is around 85%. So, yeah, and, and that's a quite an interesting result. So how, how should we say? We could say John calling is 
quite reliable but not as good as we would like it to be. Yeah? We would of course like to have one here yeah? or something close to one but 85% is not so um, sensitive. This is actually, yeah, this is kind of the sensitivity. Okay. And uh, I mean, an analog analogous computation for Mary would give us a P of Mary given burglary is only 66%. So Mary is even less reliable than John, but we would have expected this. Why? If you look at this, uh, because of this value, because the reaction of Mary on alarm is only 70%, but John has 90%. Yeah? So we would have expected uh, uh, such a difference. <coughs> okay, um, and now we can we can compute P of John or Mary given burglary, and here here I use a nice a common trick in uh, yeah, probab probability calculations. Whenever you have an or. Um, then directly uh, computing the probability for the OR conjunction of two variables most of the time is difficult. And therefore we use contraposition. Yeah? Um, so the contraposition formula is um, yeah, P of two variables, P of A or B is equal to um, no, 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 we don't, we don't, we don't use the probability here. A or B is nothing but not, not A and not B. This is contraposition, okay? So we replace the A or B by, so we replace John or Mary by uh, not, not John and not Mary. Okay, and uh, so the probability of the negation of something is 1 minus the probability of something. Okay, and now, now here, this is the probability for uh, not John and not Mary given uh, burglary. But now we know John and Mary are conditionally independent given burglary and therefore we can write this uh, term um, just as P of not John given burglary times P of not Mary given burglary um, and uh, yeah we know these. We know P of John given burglary 0.849 um, so we take uh, 1 minus this times 1 minus this and the result is 0 0.051 and we get 0.948. So you see um, the probability that either one of these two guys calls given a burglary is higher than the, the highest of the, of the two. Okay, yeah, that's quite nice to know, but the even more important thing we want to know is what? It's just the other way around. Here we have P of John given burglary, but we want to know the probability for a burglary given that John calls. So we have to swap the two variables, John and burglary. And how can we do that? How is this famous formula called? It's the base formula. We are talking about Bayesian networks, so why don't we use the base formula? 
here. P of burglary given John is P of John given burglary times P of burglary divided by P of John. This is the base formula uh, for these two variables. And now we know this guy, 0.849, we know this, 0.001, and we know P of John, 0.052, and then we get 0.016. And this is, yeah, I mean, this is again about, I mean, I hope you remember the example I gave you when we talked about the base formula. Huh? Uh, you cannot, you cannot rely, so if you, if you know P of John given burglary is quite high, then the swapped conditional probability need not be high. And you can see here, this is very small. Huh? So the probability that there is a burglary if John calls is only 1.6 percent. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of surprising, but if you look at these priors, it is no longer surprising. The reason is that the prior probability for a burglary is very small. Huh? Okay, and now if we compute the same thing uh, with respect to Mary, then, uh, I mean this is also very small, but it is much higher than uh, what we get from uh, John. And now, here you see the really interesting result. If we then compute P of burglary given John and Mary, then we have a significantly higher number. So this is almost 30 yeah? percent. So now we know what to do with our Bayesian network. Um, so when I sit in the office, and I get a call from John, I would just ignore it and say, okay, yeah, there might be a burglary, but no, I guess there is nothing. If Mary calls, maybe that makes me a little bit nervous, but if they are both calling John and Mary, then with uh, 30, almost 30% 30 probability, I know there was a burglary, and that maybe that makes me nervous. Why do we take 0.0.2 from P of J, P of John? In the graph it was uh, 0.9 for because, uh, uh, for 2 and 0.05. In the graph? Oh, but I mean there is, there is no P of John. I mean this is probability for John given alarm and probability for John given not alarm. So we have to calculate the probability of John. Huh? How, how, how do we do that? We can do it on the blackboard, no problem. So how, how should we start? P of John. And I tell you, we only need this CPT here. Or do we? No, that's not true. But we start with this CPT. Now what is the first thing we have to do? We have to, to introduce the, the variable alarm here. And how does it work? That's P of John comma alarm plus P of John comma not alarm. Okay, and now we do not have these conjunction probabilities, we just have conditional probabilities. So we write this as P of John given alarm times P of alarm plus P of John given not alarm 
times P of not alone. Okay. And now you see what we need to know is P of alarm and P of not alarm. And then uh, we are finished. Uh, so I don't know, did we, did we already calculate P of alarm? No, not yet. Okay, but we would have to, we would do the same thing. We would now introduce burglary and earthquake here and then using the other CPTs and finally we would have this. Okay, um, yes. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. And now, now let's look at this again. I mean, we, we, we did this uh, before. P of John given burglary, we started in this way, and so on. We got, we got actually this formula. Huh? And that's what we write down here again. P of John given burglary is equal to this right-hand side. Huh? And what we did here is, that's what I told you, we introduced this intermediate variable alarm in between these two guys. And we got this formula. Huh? And this can be, of course, generalized to arbitrary variables A and B. So P of A given B, and now we squeeze this variable C in between. Um, and how do we do that? You, you see, we sum over all values of this intermediate variable alarm. Huh? And that's what we have see here. We, we have a sum over all variables, lowercase c, of our, uh, over all values uh, of this new variable capital C. So P of A given B and C times P of uh, C given B. Uh, that's what we have here. You see, we, we, get, we introduce this new variable alarm here and uh, not alarm. This is the sum of all values. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, what is the difference? I mean, uh, maybe you're a little bit worried about this B here. Uh, here, we just put the alarm, P of John given alarm, but this was because of the conditional independence of John and burglary given alarm. But in general, if we have no conditional independence, we have to keep the, P, the B here. Huh? If now, if um, A is conditionally independent a and B are conditionally independent given C, then we could omit the B here. This is the general formula, the conditioning formula, which we can use to introduce a new variable. Okay, yeah. So, and of course now you have to do a couple of exercises and compute some uh, numbers uh, for this um, example. But in practice, nobody would do the manual uh, calculation. Um, the main reason is that typically these base net Bayesian networks are much bigger than we ha have it here. And then we would have to introduce many variables. And so this has to be done on the computer. And now let's talk about software. There is nowadays quite a number of software packages for Bayesian networks. Um, but we start with what we already have, with Maxent. I mean, a Bayesian network, this reasoning with Bayesian networks, you have seen it. It's just probabilistic calculus. Huh? With some um, conditional independence assumptions. Oh, there is nothing in between here. Um, now, if we do have this knowledge about this Bayesian network, um, then we can, we can use Maxent to compute the results because Maxent 
gives us uh, optimal perfect <coughs> results. So what we have to write down as an input file for maxend is what we have here. And what do we have here? I mean, this is the definition of the variables. And now we enter these, how many was it? Ten? Ten values out of our CPTs. These two prior probabilities. This is the CPT for alarm given burglary and earthquake. We get these four values. This is John given alarm. And this is Mary given alarm. So this is a knowledge we enter. And then we can ask such a query. Uh, so, probability for burglary given John and Mary calling. And the response is, I mean, of course, we get, we get the value we computed before. Okay, I mean, this is not surprising that we can do it with PIT. Yeah? Um, the, the disadvantage of PIT is that in case of extremely large Bayesian networks, maybe PIT would consume a little bit much uh, time. And there are other software packages too. Um, yeah. There is, uh, for example, I will now show you this Java based software, um, but there is um, a lot of others. Um, and. Um, Maybe the one of the oldest and uh, maybe one uh, also one of the most sophisticated Bayesian network tools and with the best user interface, but also it costs uh, uh, most money is Hugin. Yeah? Hugin. Hugin was developed in Aalborg in Denmark by a number of really well-known, maybe I should say famous uh, uh, mathematicians in, in probabilistic reasoning. So there was Finn Jensen. Oh, actually his book should be here. Let's look. No, it's not here. So if it's not here, then it's at home on my desk. Excuse me? Mathematics. You said it's mathematics scientists. Uh, yes, but it's not here. I mean, it it would be somewhere in. Yeah, it should be actually here in the AI part. No, it's in, it's at home on my desk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jensen was one of the these people, and uh, I guess Spiegelhalter too. Yeah. Okay, but I don't uh, demonstrate the Hugin tool because this is very expensive and I don't have a license uh, for this. So I show you this uh, nice little Java based tool which for our purpose is perfectly sufficient. Now, yeah, let's look into Java base. Um, yeah, I already uh, started it here. Uh, I mean, th this is... Uh, this is a public domain. You can just download the software and uh, run it on your computer. And so I already uh, started it and you get two windows. Huh? So there is this window, the Java Base Editor, where you can edit such a Bayesian network. And uh, there is this console window um, and um, this John Mary example comes already with the software, so you can just lo load it from the examples directory. If we look here, yeah, so up here you see there is this uh, example subdirectory and there is this John Mary call subdirectory and there are these uh, three files and if you load this John Mary dot bif file, then uh, you get this network. Huh? And now, inside this network, you can, for example, edit such a node. Huh? We, uh, so if we go on edit function uh, and then alarm, we now edit the alarm node. And now look at what we have. What we have here, this is just uh, the CPT. Um, yes. 
This is, the, I mean, this is half of the CPT. This is for the case earthquake falls and burglary falls, then the probability for alarm is 0 0.01. Is that true? If you look into the book, earthquake falls and burglary falls, yes, it's 0 0.001. Or for the case burglary true and earthquake falls, we have 0.95. Is that true? No, we should have we should have 0.95 for burglary true and earthquake true. Burglary true and earthquake falls. Yeah, that's that's kind of funny. Let me look. What do we have for earthquake true? Oh, we have 0.95 in both cases. False. True. That's kind of funny. Okay, so we have to edit this. So how is it in the book? We have uh, 0.94 for burglary true and earthquake false. So here, here we should uh, uh, change this into 0.94 and the rest is true, is it? Now if we put it true then we get 0.95 and 0.29, yeah, that's okay. Apply. Okay, and now we can close this. Huh? And we can look at all the other nodes. Um, now suppose they are correct. Maybe we just check earthquake. Yeah, it's 0 0.002, <coughs> which is correct. Um, and now we can ask queries. Query, yeah. Now we can ask, we can query, for example, earthquake. That's just a question, what is the probability for earthquake? I mean, this is trivial. We would then in the console window here see the probability for earthquake is 0 0.002. It's more interesting to query Mary. And now we get P of Mary, the probability, the unconditional probability for Mary calling this would be 0 0.0117. Huh? Um, and this is not interesting either. Interesting is it if we, uh, we want to know uh, conditional probabilities. And that's what we can do if we use this observe button. We can, for example, observe burglary. Um, yes, uh, burglary observed, and then we make it true. Okay, and then now it's burglary is blue, and now we can query uh, Mary. And we get P of Mary given burglary 0.665. Is that what we had? Mary given burglary I thought we we computed this too yeah p of ah yeah p of Mary point six five nine is what we had, so maybe some of the numbers are not exactly the same. 0.665, yeah. Let's look at John. 0.85, yes, it's different too. So maybe we should look at this alarm table again. 
earthquake falls. Point zero five is falls. Should be point zero six. Here. Yes. Oh really? They have to start up to one, don't they? Point nine four oh yes, yes, you're right. Y yes, yes, you're right. So this is the yeah, yeah. Of course. Thank you. Apply. Okay, and now let's ask uh, Mary again. Oh, sorry. Is that correct? Yeah, that was uh, seventy percent and <coughs> and one. Curry, Mary. Point six five eight. That's what we what we uh, got. And now John, point eight four nine. Yeah, that that's correct. Okay. And I mean, you can play around. You can observe variables and ask for other variables. Um, or we maybe we can ask for p of earthquake given burglary. What would you expect as a result? Same as yes, they're because they are independent, and that's what we get. Okay, yeah, it's a nice tool. Um, yes, maybe I should say a few words about other features of powerful tools. I mean, that's basically what this Java-based tool can do. If you look at Hugin, we used uh, Hugin in a in a little student project uh, the task of this student was to implement our uh, lexmate system using a bayesian network huh? so he modeled the lexmate application using hugin huh? and i mean of course we could just enter all the information we have carefully into Hugin and we would get the same result as we had with Lexmate. Huh? But we thought, okay, let's look whether this Hugin is smart and um, it actually turned out that Hugin is not smart. <laughs> um, what we did, I mean, what, uh, an, a nice feature of Hugin is that Hugin at least is supposed to be able to learn the structure of the Bayesian network. I mean, if I know the structure of my network and I just input the structure, then Hugin would just, uh, from the database, compute the conditional probabilities and nothing surprising would, uh, would be the result. But if Hugin is able to by itself from the data learn the structure of the network. That would be great. But it turned out that we get extremely complicated networks with extremely many um, arrows and edges in the network and that was chaotic and we didn't get good results. But, I mean, it, it's a nice feature that, in principle, Hugin is able to learn the structure of the network, but it turns out that these algorithms are by far not good enough. Okay, um, yeah. let's go back to the slides. Okay, and, and of course, I mean, you can use uh, Java base for your exercises, uh, it's no problem. Okay, I talked about Hugin. Oh yes, and another another feature is continuous variables are possible inside uh, Hugin, and that's very important because uh, in in real applications we often do have continuous variables, uh, but and this is not possible uh, with Java base, and as I already mentioned, it can learn the the structure of the networks. Okay, yeah, so now let's, uh, we did not talk about yet uh, how we develop such a network. We just had this network, this alarm network, but how do we develop the network? 
how do we find the relevant variables, how do we order these variables, how do we um, derive the structure of the network and so on. Yeah. Um, yes. So, yeah, we can actually omit this slide. Um, yeah, that's what, I mean, th this computation and these little formulas, they are in the book, but finally what we get as a result is the number of, the, the total number of values inside our CPTs in the alarm network, and which is 10 what we saw already. Um, okay, yeah. Here you can see um, how LexMed as a Bayesian network would look like. You have seen this graph already. That's what we call the independence graph. And from our correlation analysis, we came to the conclusion that this might be the graph for our LexMed application. The only thing we added here now is the arrows for these uh, edges here. So we made all these edges directed edges. And now, of course, the question is, uh, who tells me whether this edge has to go left to right or right to left? The answer is quite simple. Um, whenever we use directed Bayesian networks, um, the direction has to be uh, from the cause to the conclusion. So we all, the, all the edges need to have a causal direction. Uh, and of course, in, in LexMed, the cause is appendicitis. Appendicitis is the cause, and this cause leads to some symptoms. Uh, uh, so the symptoms, all the symptoms, uh, result from the appendicitis. That's why these arrows have to be drawn in this direction. That's quite important. Uh, um, now, how about these arrows here? Yeah, this is not so trivial, and it actually doesn't matter. So you can draw it in this direction or in the other direction, unless there is an obvious causal relationship. But is there a relationship between, let me see, between leukocytes and age? Hmm. Now, if there would be one, then I would say it should actually be in the other direction. But it, it finally, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter uh, which direction we use out here. Okay, now let's look um, at our, yeah, no, let, let's look at the LexMate, yeah. Um, so if we consider LexMate with this, with the structure of this network, and then we would know how our CPTs would look like. For example, here I would have a CPT pr uh, with the probabilities for S for this variable given appendicitis and given, uh, so given uh, the inflamed, the perforated, the negative and the other disease. So this would be a CPT conditioned on these four values and this is the same for all these va uh, variables. And uh, for example, for this variable, I would have a CPT conditioned on these two variables. So if we write down all the CPTs and use the formula uh, uh, from one or two slides before, which is this formula, then we just get, I mean, this is just the sum of the number of the values in all the CPTs, and this finally ends up with 521. Huh? So that would mean, if you think of LexMed, and, and the, the, this PIT input file, in this PIT input file, we would have 521 lines. In each line, we would have one such rule with a value. 
Yeah, and you see the size of our Bayesian network in the LexMed example is 521 values compared to the size of the whole distribution, which would be 20 million. Yeah. And you can, as you can see, there are um, extremely many pairs of variables are independent or conditionally independent. Otherwise, our Bayesian network would have 20 million uh, values. Okay, yeah. Now before we um, look at how we develop our alarm network, um, we have to talk about <coughs> causality and network structure. Huh? Um, so whenever we construct a Bayesian network, step number one is uh, develop the structure of the network. Huh? That's what we do first, and this has to be done manually. Um, and then, once we have the structure, then we just have to fill our CPTs. That's easy. Huh? And of course, it can be done automatically. Okay, but we have to respect causality. And that means we have to start with the reasons for the whole uh, thing, which are burglary and earthquake. So these two are variables number one and two. We start with these two variables. Huh? Um, and then variable number three is alarm, because alarm directly depends on these two guys. And then variables number five and six are John and Mary. That's how such a network is being developed. And on this slide you can see how the, the, the network construction uh, goes. We start with these, uh, the, the elementary reasons, these two variables. Um, I mean, actually, we start with one of them. Suppose we start with burglary. Burglary is the first variable. And then we enter the second variable. And now we have to ask a question. Which quest question must we ask here? Oh, it's simple. The question is, do we need an arrow between these two or not? How can we find out whether we need a connection or no? So we have to check if it is independent. Yes. Yes, you're right. We have to check whether these two guys are independent. And how do we check this? How can we check this? I mean, there are two ways. So, we examine uh, the probability of these two variables. So, mm -hmm. if it is zero, I'd say it's going to be good. Oh, no. Oh, no. You shouldn't have said this. The first sentence was, was good. I liked it. But the second, I mean, if a, if a probability is zero, this doesn't tell me something, uh, something about independence. Huh? No. We have to check probabilities. What, what, what do we need to check? We have to check whether P of burglary um, and earthquake, for example, is equal to P of burglary times P of earthquake. That's what we have to check. We have to check whether this equation holds. And how do we do that? I mean, we just make observations. We make observations. Uh, maybe that's not so easy because we don't have an earthquake every day. Maybe we have to wait 100 years um, and observe many, or 1,000 years, and observe many earthquakes and many burglaries and always compute this probability. So, I mean, if it's uh, 1,000 years, then it's 365,000 days. And among these days, we just count how many days are there where we had both. 
Maybe it was on five days. Huh? And uh, now, and, and, we, and then the probability is 5 over 365,000. That's the left-hand side, and then we do the same thing for the right-hand side. We look on how many days there was a burglary, and then how many days there was an earthquake, and then we compute the product of these two guys, and then this product has to be close to this value. Huh? I mean, if this is 0 0.001 and this is 0 0.9, then something is wrong. Huh? Okay, so that's, that's uh, possibility number one, but we have seen uh, maybe that in order to get sufficient statistics, that would take us 1,000 years. Huh? That's too long. We, we don't want to wait so long. Um, so way number two is just do intuitive reasoning. Uh, as I did before. So, um, earthquakes are not intelligent beings. Uh, so they don't know about what burglars are doing. Maybe the other, the other way around it's more difficult and then we, yeah, and then it's getting difficult. But these are the two ways how we can do it. Okay, now suppose these two guys are independent, so we enter these two nodes, and then we start with node number two, which is alarm. And uh, we already entered these two arrows. Why did we enter these? I mean, we, we skipped one step. In the next step, we would actually have no arrows, but why do, why do we need these two arrows? Because alarm is not independent from burglary. So burglary and alarm are not independent. At least <laughs> if this device that we buy at the Media Markt store or whatever, um, if this device is not completely useless. I mean, maybe if this device is actually a refrigerator, then maybe a sounding would be independent from alarm. Yeah? But if it's a, a, a serious alarm device, of course there is some dependence, and uh, it turns out there is some dependence here too. Okay, so we, we enter these two arrows, and we are finished. And now we, we take our next variable, John, and again, um, so if John is not completely crazy, sometimes he will uh, react on the alarm and therefore these two guys are not independent. Huh? And now we have to be careful because we added this arrow and now we have to ask whether we need other arrows. For example, this one. Yeah. But we do not need it. I already talked about this before. We don't need it because John and burglary are conditionally independent given alarm. And we have to ask another question. Which question must we ask too? The question uh, that we have to ask is about all possible arrows we could add. And of course, there might be one from earthquake to John. But we don't need it because John is conditionally independent from earthquake given alarm. Okay, so, so much about the John variable and then of course we add the Mary variable, and Mary depends on alarm. Um, and we, and uh, now we have to ask the same question. Is John conditionally independent uh, from earthquake given alarm? And is Mary conditionally independent from burglary given alarm? Both answers are no, and that's why we do not need uh, such edges. And the last question we have to ask is, what? 
Yeah. Yes. Are John and Mary independent given alarm? Huh? If they are, then we do not add uh, such an arrow. That's how we construct such a Bayesian network. And um, it is very important that the order of your variables is does respect causality. That's very important. If you do not respect causality, you can produce a Bayesian network. And if you do it in the right way, it will work at the end. And um, hopefully it would even produce the same results. But the structure of your network may be quite ugly. Huh? And there is, in the exercises in the book, there is one exercise where you <coughs> have to construct this network but with a different variable order. And when you compare the network construction with what we did here, you will really see it is so difficult because you have, have to ask such uh, crazy questions where the variables are not in the causal order and you have no idea. Uh, so it's, it, it really gets ugly. Uh, I mean, I put this exercise for you such that you learn, okay, it's much better to use the causal order. Huh? Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's time uh, to have a break. So we, it's 11.20, so we meet at 11.35 again. Thank you.